we have three major mission updates from NASA. Let's discuss them one by one. NASA is targeting the next launch attempt of the Artemis 1 mission for November 14, with the liftoff of the SLS rocket carrying the Orion spacecraft planned during a 69-minute launch window that opens at 4.07 a.m. UTC. The agency has also requested a pair of backup launch opportunities set for November 16 and 19. NASA previously made two attempts to launch Artemis 1 in late August and early September, but they were scrubbed due to a rocket engine temperature issue and a fuel line leak. Hurricane Ian then forced the SLS rocket to be rolled back into the Vehicle Assembly Building at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, scuppering chances of a late September and October launch. According to NASA, inspections and analyses conducted over the last week confirmed that only minor work is required to prepare the rocket and spacecraft to roll out once again to launch Pad 39B. The agency intends to return the rocket to the pad as soon as November 4. NASA has confirmed that the DART probe, which deliberately crashed into the rocky moonlet Dimorphos on September 26, has succeeded in nudging the asteroid's orbit. According to data obtained from ground-based observatories over the past two weeks, the spacecraft's kinetic impact with Dimorphos changed the asteroid's orbit around a larger asteroid, Didymos, by 32 minutes. Dimorphos, which previously took 11 hours and 55 minutes to orbit Didymos, now completes an orbit in 11 hours and 23 minutes. DART's achievement marked the first time humanity altered the motion of a celestial body. The research team is still acquiring data from ground-based observatories around the world, and attention has now shifted toward measuring the efficiency of momentum transfer during the collision. Please check out my previous video to learn more about NASA's double asteroid redirection test, link in the description. NASA revealed that the Capstone spacecraft has returned to normal operations a few weeks after it uncontrollably went tumbling into space. The Cislinar Autonomous Positioning System Technology Operations and Navigation Experiment, or Capstone, is a lunar orbiter launched in June aboard a Rocket Lab Electron rocket to test and validate the calculated orbital stability for the Lunar Gateway Space Station. Following a planned trajectory correction maneuver on September 8, Capstone suffered an issue that caused the spacecraft to spin beyond the capacity of the onboard reaction wheels to control and counter. Data from the spacecraft suggest the most likely cause was a partially open valve on one of the spacecraft's eight thrusters. Because the valve was partially open, the thruster produced thrust whenever the propulsion system was pressurized. According to NASA, recovery commands executed on October 7 restored the 25-kg spacecraft to normal operations, and the probe has ceased spinning and regained full three-axis attitude control. Over the coming days, the team will monitor the spacecraft's status and will work to design possible fixes for the valve-related issue to reduce the risk for future maneuvers. Capstone is still on track to enter its desired near-rectilinear halo orbit around the moon on November 13. Please see my previous videos for more information on the Capstone mission and the recent anomaly. Links in the description. The Rocket Lab Electron rocket successfully launched a wildlife data collecting satellite to space on October 7 from Pad B at Launch Complex 1 in New Zealand. About 55 minutes after liftoff, the Electron Kick stage deployed its payload, the Gazelle satellite, into a 750 km sun synchronous orbit. The Gazelle spacecraft, built by General Atomics, houses the Argus-4 instrument, which is used by the U.S. and French governments for wildlife tracking, maritime security, and fishery monitoring. The Argus program is best known for tracking marine animals such as whales, seals, sea turtles, etc. The wildlife tracking program dates back to the 1970s, with Argus-4 representing the most advanced receivers ever flown. The October 7 launch was Rocket Lab's 8th of 2022 and the 31st Electron mission overall. The next Rocket Lab Electron mission is scheduled for December 2022 from Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport on Wallops Island, Virginia. The mission will deploy three satellites for American geospatial analytics company Hawkeye 360 and will mark Rocket Lab's first liftoff from U.S. soil. The Electron rocket, which will be used for that mission, has already arrived at Virginia's Launch Complex 2. Rocket Lab will soon begin final launch preparations, including a standard launch dress rehearsal and payload integration, at Rocket Lab's facility near the launch site. China launched the Advanced Space-Based Solar Observatory, nicknamed Kuafa-1, on October 8 atop a Long March 2D rocket from Jiaquan Satellite Launch Center. The mission was confirmed a success when the satellite entered the designated 720 km sun-synchronous orbit. The 888 kg Kuafa-1 is the world's first near-Earth satellite telescope that can simultaneously monitor solar flares, coronal mass ejections, and the sun's magnetic field. The solar probe, with a projected life of four years, is capable of probing the sun 24 hours a day for most of the year. 
The instruments on board the observatory include a magnetograph to study the sun's magnetic field, an X-ray imager for studying the high-energy radiations released by electrons accelerated in solar flares, and a coronagraph which will look at the sun in the ultraviolet and visible ranges. The spacecraft is designed to collect and send 500 gigabytes of data daily, equivalent to tens of thousands of high-quality images. The spacecraft's unique ability to study the middle corona, an important region of the sun where solar storms brew, will allow scientists to capture and study previously unprecedented images of the sun during solar maximum, which is expected to peak around 2025. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. SpaceX stacked a Starship vehicle on the launch pad at its Starbase facility for the first time since March. However, the agency later ran into some troubles. Let's go through the events in order. Super Heavy Booster 7, which arrived at the launch site after robustness upgrades, was the first to go on top of the orbital launch mount. Booster 7 stacking took place on October 10, and you can see from this Lab Padre rover cam footage that the prototype was missing two inner Raptor engines at the time of lift. One of the missing Raptor engines was installed on Monday, and the other is yet to be installed. The first attempt to lift Starship 24 and stack it atop Booster 7 was aborted by SpaceX on Tuesday, when the tower arms could not reach close enough to connect to the lifting pins under the ship's forward flaps. This was because the cushioning pads installed on the arm rails were too thick to fit with the lifting pins. Those pads are designed to act as shock absorbers while catching Starships and boosters from mid-air. Workers spent several hours removing the pads and fixing the issue before attempting a second lift. On Tuesday evening, the launch tower arms carefully connected to Ship 24, gently lifted it from its transport stand, moved upwards, and slowly lowered it on top of the booster. The lift and stacking operation took about an hour to complete, and it took two more hours for SpaceX to fully secure the prototypes together. Nearly 21 hours after the full stack, teams lifted Ship 24 a few feet above Booster 7 to correct some alignment issues. As you can see, when teams attempted to secure the prototypes during Tuesday's stacking operation, they weren't properly aligned and were rocking back and forth. SpaceX previously employed a claw-like mechanism to stabilize the booster prior to full stack, but that claw was later removed from the tower because SpaceX found it redundant. The Starship 20 and Booster 4 full stack that happened in March was performed without the claw, and the process went off without any alignment issues. But on Tuesday, both prototypes were too tricky to stabilize and secure, resulting in misalignments. After lifting the ship from the booster on Wednesday, teams worked on the prototypes to fix whatever was causing the problem. After nearly 30 minutes of work, Ship 24 was again stacked atop Booster 7, this time without any hitch. Hours later, teams connected the quick disconnect mechanism to the ship's QD panel. However, the mechanism was retracted minutes later, implying that there was a problem with the connections. A team of experts worked for nearly 40 minutes on the mechanism to fix the issue. Later, the QD mechanism was once again moved forward and connected to the ship, indicating that the problem had been resolved. SpaceX attempted a full-stack cryo-proof test of Booster 7 and Ship 24 on Thursday morning. However, the test was called off just as teams were about to fill the vehicle with cryogenic liquid nitrogen. Immediately the teams rushed to the launch pad and climbed onto the Starship's quick disconnect arm to inspect the connections. Later that day, SpaceX canceled the cryo-proof test, but the reason for the cancellation is unknown. On Thursday night, teams erected scaffoldings around the quick disconnect mechanism to work on it. It looks like the QD system issue has not been resolved yet. All those issues that happen during the full stack operations serve as a reminder that rocket science is not easy, and learning from setbacks and taking corrective actions is the only way to achieve the ultimate goal. The full-stack cryo-proof tests are expected to continue next week, and if all goes well, SpaceX will move on to the static fire test campaign. The static fire tests will culminate in a full-stack 33-engine static fire. And if all ground tests go as planned, and SpaceX receives a launch license from the FAA, the orbital flight test will most likely take place by the end of this year. SpaceX announced on October 12 that it sold tickets to Dennis and Akiko Tito for a Starship mission around the moon. The flight will be a return to space for 82-year-old Dennis Tito, who flew on a Soyuz spacecraft to the ISS in April 2001 as the first private astronaut to visit the station. He spent eight days in space before returning to Earth. Akiko Tito, a 57-year-old engineer, pilot, and real estate investor who married Dennis Tito in 2020, said the flight fulfills an interest in space dating back to her childhood. The two are the first of as many as 12 people who will go on that mission whose schedule is unclear. 
The mission involves a starship launched into low Earth orbit that would rendezvous with a depot starship for propellant refilling. Once the lunar-bound starship's tanks are filled, it will fire its engines on a circumlunar trajectory that will take it around the moon and within 200 kilometers of its surface before safely returning to Earth. The entire mission would take about a week. This mission is expected to launch after the Polaris program's first flight of Starship and Yusaku Mizawa's Dear Moon mission. Now, let's go back to Starbase. At the build site, teams have begun installing grid fins on the methane tank section of Super Heavy Booster 9. They have already fully stacked both methane and oxygen tank sections, and once these sections are joined together, we will have the 69-meter tall Booster 9 standing inside the wide bay. Booster 9 will feature a number of upgrades compared to Booster 7. Most notably, design changes to isolate and protect the Raptor engines of the booster if one of them explodes during a tester flight. The nose cone section of Starship 26 has already been stacked atop the payload bay section, and teams are now focusing on stacking the propellant tank sections. The common dome and a four-ring oxygen tank section of Ship 26 were moved into the high bay on Tuesday night. They were later stacked together. Teams are also building a super heavy booster test tank, dubbed Booster 6, at the production yard. The test tank will be subjected to cryoproof tests in the near future to test the recent super heavy design changes. The tests will most probably happen at SpaceX's Massey's facility, which is approximately 7.5 kilometers away from Starbase. The Starlink satellite dispenser was installed in the payload bay section of Ship 28 on Wednesday afternoon. The satellite dispenser is designed to deploy Starlink satellites into orbit during the orbital flight of Ship 28. At SpaceX's Roberts Road facility, teams have begun prefabricating the sections for the Kennedy Space Center's second Starship launch tower. The location of the tower is still unknown. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.